Hello everyone and welcome to this, the third in our webinar series that we've been doing on the situation we currently find ourselves in. So the, the first webinar was all around managing that initial crisis and getting over those first hurdles. The second one was about managing the hard yards and, and the new norm that we find ourselves in. And I'm delighted to be joined today by Melanie Fitzpatrick and from CPA Global to talk about the third phase in what we'll be doing, which is that transition through a return to work and getting back to work. Um, Melanie is the has a global responsibility for strategy, brand and people at CPA Global, which is an organisation which is essential and critical to the support of the intellectual property sector and enabling that intellectual property. This enables her, entails her overseeing people and corporate strategy, but also brand and positioning, culture. So she has a wide range of issues and tasks that she can talk to us about today and give us some key insights on. So Mel, thank you very much for, for taking the time to come in and, and join us today and to, to be um, with, with all of us. It's a pleasure, Chris. Delighted to be here. Thank you. Um, so we do have a Twitter hashtag running for today's webinar, which is hashtag Quirk Webinar. If you'd like to use that to start to engage and to have conversations via Twitter. Um, but before we start and get into the actual, this first webinar, what I'd like to do is to, is to ask a poll. And I'm going to launch a poll for everybody just to look at how many people in your organization currently are either working from home or are working remotely who weren't before. Uh, are, is that most of your organization? Is it some of your organization? Or are you a really busy organization at the moment and therefore everybody is still at work and, and working really hard at 100% effort? So if you could just take some time to have a look at that. I think whilst you do that, we'll just set the scene a little bit for, for this webinar. I've deliberately used the term transition to, to um, you know, day, the new day one, whenever new day one happens, rather than a return or a resumption. Um, because the world clearly will be slightly different when we, when we come back to, to the working normality, whatever normality is and whenever it may happen. And there's a number of factors to consider. So if I just end the polling and share the results with you, it's quite interesting that of the, of the, the 126 people that are on this webinar this afternoon, 78% are saying that most of the people in their organization are now working from home and working remotely. So that'll really help Mel and I to, to set the context as we talk about this, this first element. So when we're thinking about this from a strategic perspective, there are some factors to, to consider. And having had a little bit of a think about it myself and in discussion with other organizations that I've been talking to, it's really hard to put a date on when that new day one will be and what it might be. And because it may be at different times for different organizations, some organizations essentially, it won't be any different because they are still operating at full speed right now. But if we just take it as a tentative viable in six months, and we have defined what that viable in six months means in terms of the success factors, what does it mean in terms of our organization, our people, how many people are still in the organization, maybe our revenues or our profits or any other metrics that we want to judge that, that there are a number of factors that we probably want to be thinking about and people seem to be thinking about right now, which I've tried to capture on this strategy wheel. So there's ones in blue that are mostly focused around people. So looking after our people, looking after those individuals around us, our colleagues as well. So it's not just about leaders, it's also about teamwork, but it's also about how maybe cultures and behaviors are shifting as well as training people, training our talent and, and bringing them up to speed. Then we've got in green the situational awareness piece. How are we tracking what is going on? How are we able to understand what might be coming down the pipeline towards us so we can be the first to react and the first to adapt and the first to overcome that potential hurdle coming down the, down the pipeline at us? 
In yellow, then, there's the detailed planning and testing and sustaining the work that's going on right now. So that's kind of like the nitty gritty that we want to be into. And then, then we've got the, in the pinky area, we've got this clean sheet thinking, innovation, creativity. Is now the time to start to consider a new version of our organization? Is the appetite there from people within our organization for that change and transformation? So should we take advantage of that right now? So what we're going to do um, through this webinar is essentially look at those four key areas, people, situational awareness, detailed planning and testing, and also the innovation side. So Mel, if I could turn to you now and just ask, what sort of issues, if we're talking about people issues, what sort of people issues are you seeing currently within CPA Global and across CPA Global? but also maybe amongst your clients and amongst your networks? Yeah, thanks, Chris. A uh, great question. I think, you know, what, what I'm seeing um, overall and, and globally, uh, we're a business of three and a half thousand people, uh, a lot of customers across the globe. Um, we're seeing a lot of, a lot of shifts and shapes, uh, seeing a lot of number of issues arising. Um, however, it's, it's highly dependent on location. Uh, for instance, what we're seeing uh, in Asia Pacific is um, people are uh, the further down in the journey. So we're seeing uh, people, you know, normalize the working from home. We've got 97% of our people uh, working from home right now. We're seeing APAC where people are, you know, kind of, kind of in, into a rhythm, but they're fatigued. Uh, whereas we're seeing people in Europe and, and North America, you know, moving across the globe. Um, a sense of adjustment, uh, they're further behind, um, but getting into a rhythm. Um, so we're seeing you know, varying degrees depending on location globally. Um, I think from a, an overall perspective, you know, thinking about people, which is, is something you know, very close to my heart, we, we are seeing without a doubt a long-term impact. I think that's you know, got a level of certainty around it, but we're thinking about you know, how can we prepare ourselves as an organization and with our customers to, you know, be ready for, you know, when we come out of, of this crisis. Mm -hmm. In terms of some of the key observations I'm seeing, um, probably the, the biggest area is around mindset. Um, I think, you know, one of the biggest challenges during this crisis is maintaining morale and, you know, and helping people adjust there are levels of stress around family you know personal lives there's fear and anxiety um you know around their work are they doing a great job are they doing enough uh, are they focusing on the right things so i think generally there's a, a challenge around morale and you know this stresses and, and fears around you know what people are doing in their lives but i, I generally think there's a move towards acceptance of the new way um, there's definitely an appetite for, and we're seeing this in our organization, um, an appetite to use this as an opportunity for learning. Um, I'm seeing, you know, a real, you know, positive move in, you know, in talent around people stepping up. And, and honestly, it, I, I've just been so impressed, proud with people, you know, across our organization and in our customers, you know, stepping up uh, and seeing some, you know, great people rise and, and take on more. Um, I think there's also been a, a mindset shift around collaboration. Um, you know, we're definitely seeing this in our internal organization and, and communities globally, but also with our customers and in our category, there's a, a kind of sentiment of we're all in it together. Um, seeing a real shift around, you know, people working closer, collaborating. Um, but what we're also seeing is that, um, you know, it's really important around um, people getting their heads around what's priority and what's not. This has probably been one of the biggest learnings for us around, you know, leadership and management, working with, you know, teams of people across the globe to make sure they know what, what is important and what's not. So I think that that's from a mindset, mindset perspective. A um, couple of other things I'm seeing, um, work patterns, um, you know, again, on the theme of priorities, you know, balancing home life, work life. Look, this is a huge issue for myself included. You know, homeschooling. Uh, yeah. You balance out. You know, looking after your family and and working from home. So we're seeing an extension in working hours, which 
you know, we're, we're working really hard to accommodate flexibility. We're, we're wide open. People have changed the times they work. You know, a, a risk is around burnout. Yes. So, you know, we're, we're focusing really on, you know, how people can make adjustments. You know, for us, it's not about, you know, how many hours people are doing. It's about the outcome. And, and I have to say, we've seen a dramatic shift in um you know, focused and positive outcomes through people actually just using their own initiative. Um, again, from work patterns, um, we've seen a, you know, when I, when I think about the phasing globally, we've seen a big shift. There's, there's been actually a period of what I would call overcompensation. A lot of people working very hard to do things, um, but now we're seeing a kind of, you know, steady cadence, people adjusting, etc. cetera. Um, and again, the, the big thing which we're, quite clearly on now is the amount of face time. I think this has been a major piece of feedback, you know, within our customer base, within our, our own business, and then, you know, personal network. Um, a lot of people finding it, you know, a big shift and actually some exhaustion around this, around, you know, used to do calls, used to have, you know, conversations face to face. You know, video seems to be a little bit more intense. So again, I think it's taking uh, a bit of adjustment um, final point from me on the people piece um, is um, what, what, which I view as a massive, um, you know, positive in this this current crisis is the amount of new thinking coming through. Um, you know, I'm observing and hearing this, reading this a lot around people challenging the way things have always been done. Yes. And the new, new approaches to, you know, for us as an example, the way we deliver and engage with customers. And the way we work ourselves internally, um, you know, there's some really kind of dynamic thinking around how do we change things? Because my view is things will never be the same. It'll be very different when we move forward. And um, final point, which is, again, um, um, really important for me, for our business, um, is culture. You know, we've worked very hard in our organization to build, you know, a very inclusive, open, transparent culture, which takes a long time to build and I, and I think a risk right now with people culture takes a long time to build but it can be destroyed in an instant so I think yes. how we all as leaders and managers support people through uncertain times care have conversations reach out um, you know I feel as an organization a sense of responsibility that you know we all need to look out for each other and, and what we'll remember um, you know, post this time, both from a, an internal and customer perspective, is the, the tone, the way we interact, the way we cared. So I think in, a, in, a, in summary, um, seeing and observing lots of change, um, some of it challenging, but some real positivity around new thinkings and, and new ways of doing things. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Miles. That's That's really, really useful stuff. Uh, there's lots to I want to pick up from on there and take forward. But before I start to respond back with some of the thoughts that have been triggered by what you've been saying, there's just been some interesting questions coming in. And so maybe if I throw one your way and for you to think about whilst I, I'll do the next bit to allow you some thinking time. Um, there's one in from Charles Webb um, saying it's an interesting point on focus of priorities and collaboration. Um, and who has changed most, in your opinion, employees or leaders? And, and then Trudy Stevens has also picked up the same sort of same sort of um, refrain, if you like, that she's saying that many trends are being accelerated as a result of this pandemic. Um, and do you think there'll be amplifications of tensions between authority and managers and leaders? So people having stepped up and shown that talent that you were talking about and demonstrated that talent that you're talking about. You know, will they be comfortable when we transition back to going back to a slightly different you know position because the shift has already happened if you like and can we put that genie back in the box um so there's a couple of couple of really interesting sort of points there that comes around the chat on, on and on the on the question question side of things i think um we've got one in from an honest attorney how do cultural dimensions impact resilience to the challenges now so what what role does culture play in resilience not just now but medium to longer term um, and then David Hurd is asking a question around driving the level of fatigue. Um, is this down to actually us doing more because we're more productive due to the remote working or is the fatigue due to the 
utilization of things like this. I know I certainly find myself a bit more tired when I'm using these sorts of things. So we'll pick up on all of those, but I'll, I'll just allow you some thinking time. I'll, I'll come back on some of the points that you've raised, I think, particularly for me around that impact that you were talking about of um, people, whether we shift back to a new reality or whether the cursor swings back quite quickly to where we were before. I think certainly there is going to be a, a real speed bump when we come out of this and we transition out of this simply because people have settled into a different routine for up to three, four, six weeks, eight weeks, however long it might be. So invariably there is going to be a shift. And in, in the last webinar that we did, I, I spoke about how the military managed that coming out of combat zones through a decompression process um, and taking people to a kind of like an interim stepping stone um, and I think that it would be useful for lots of organizations to consider what that interim stepping stone might be for themselves because whether they have had individuals working flat out because they're an industry in very high demand or whether they've had the majority of their people working from home or whether they've got a blend when you bring those populations back together you've got some who feel they've been on the front line some who've been working from home and you, you don't, as you pointed out, Mel, you don't want to you know, ruin that culture in an instant that you've taken so long to build. So I think there's, there's issues there around, you know, how do we enable that? You know, how do we get into, if you want to look at it from an emotional perspective, sharing you know, is about understanding. How can we get our people to maybe come into some interim stepping stone point between now and viable in the future to share with each other their thoughts how can we use some simple questions for them in groups to discuss that like what's been the most difficult thing for you what have you found most challenging about this because for me that sharing also builds trust and it builds empathy um, and there's a, an american u.s marine corps general called general mattis who um, a, lot, a lot of people admire within the military. Um, and General Mattis has a phrase that trust is tempo. And so I really like that. If we share more and therefore we understand more, we trust more, which builds higher tempo organizations. So you know, I, I do think that transition is potentially important. Um, and that talent issue that you mentioned as well, I think absolutely key, certainly, because not only now does this crisis type situation give us a very different lens on our organization it allows us to see people in a different light and so we see that talent bubbling up but the next question if you like almost as captured by phil jones on the last webinar is how do we enable the future how do we now retain that talent and train it and identify the training gaps that they have so that we can basically make them even more effective in the future and our organization even more effective in the future so we'll just turn to a couple of the questions then, if that's okay. And maybe now you could pick up on those sort of changes around culture, who has shifted the most employer or employee, and will employees be willing to go back to a standard role when they've been allowed to spread a few wings? Yeah, it's a great question. And um, look, I'm seeing um, both leaders and our people um, you know, step up and, and do things differently. And I think that there was a question there about prioritization. Mm. So I, I don't think it's a leaders are doing it well or not, or our people are doing it well or not. There's a real sense of together, um, you know, and, and we have leveraged our manager and leadership group um, very effectively. You know, we, we've had We've over communicated, for instance, we do a daily comms, we do a weekly CEO update, we've had leadership briefings, you know, we've, you know, we've gone on steroids in terms of communication. So I think that that has helped create a sense of togetherness. I think your point, Chris, around um, that trust and transparency, you know, has been everything for us. Yeah. Uh, but I'd say, look, you know, ha have, have leaders you know, played a big part in helping our people prioritize, of course, you know, and that's come, you know, from Exco executive, there, there are six of us on the executive team, you know, getting really focused on what matters. Um, we've gone through scenario planning, we've looked at our strategy, 
um, which Chris, you're well aware of, you, you supported us through that, building that strategic framework has yeah. given us the ability to check step, but what's priority, what's not. So, you know, we've been able to be directive, um, but allow our leaders and managers the space and autonomy to make their own decisions. So I think that fluidity in our organization has created that sense of an, an ability to allow people to prioritize themselves, which I have to say, um, you know, it, the question on culture and, you know, can we retain this, you know, togetherness and, and really intent around doing our best and people are moving really quickly. I absolutely think we can retain that. Yeah. And I think harnessing what we've created now, we, we did a huge amount of work on our culture and our values. And, you know, one of my pet hates is values on a wall and the words mean nothing. <laughs> really hard to... You know, in, in fact, our people built these values and, and, you know, had a sense of ownership, but they've served us so well as being a decision making framework around how people operate. So I think in terms of, you know, today where we are, you know, we, we I feel in some respects we've opened up the organization, you know, people feel free, they feel the ability to create, you know, within a framework. And I think that's been hugely positive. So, yeah. I think that the question on culture, you know, my point earlier is cultures can be destroyed and, and I'm seeing other organisations in other sectors who are taking the polar opposite approach. It's very command and control and you will do. Um, I think that's having a detrimental effect. I would suggest for anyone in an organisation right now, you know, create that fluidity mm -hmm. for people to, you know, thrive and, and, you know, change and step up but within the, the confines of, you know, what culture do you want to create and what's important to you? Um, so I, I personally, I, I, I avoid and, and probably have an allergic reaction to the word, it's a reset for all of us. I actually think it's a restart. It allows, you know, all of us as individuals to, to check, you know, how are we operating? How are we behaving? Yes. Um, so I think for us and, and from a personal perspective, it's been, you know, a great opportunity for us to test the strength of our culture and camaraderie and behaviours. And, and I have to say, you know, we're in a great position right now. No, absolutely. You know, and, you know, several people pointing out on the chat that leadership is everywhere right now. And it's not necessarily in those defined as leadership. Everywhere. Um, but that's also leading, um, I think, to this sense of fatigue because people are maybe doing more than they normally would do. Um, and you mentioned Asia, and there's been a couple of people commenting on the fact that, yes, they've seen the same thing across Asia you know, with Asian teams. And I certainly have had a couple of calls this week where there's been concern about some of the people in the organisation. Um, and Alistair Dornan's pointed out that there's, there's quite a bit of insight, uh, there's quite a bit of sort of uh, support to the C-suite around this and around trying to manage this. But what about support wider in the organizations and for, for employees. Um, and Alison Kerr's asking a similar sort of thing, you know, how, how are we trying to, what actions are you taking within your own business to guide and prepare managers to help their teams remain engaged um, and energized throughout this? Yeah, so we're, we're doing a number of things. We have a, um, as I mentioned earlier, a very um, kind of, robust and ongoing and regular comms program so we are over communicating and informing um, we're actually working with our leaders and managers around helping them with communications we have a global people team uh, we've done webinars on how to work from home mm -hmm. to deal with you know fatigue and stress we've got a big well-being program running right now. Um, we've also guided, we, we adopted LinkedIn Learning as a platform, um, actually just before we went into the crisis, and we're helping our leaders and our managers, you know, look at training and, and learning for them in terms yes. of, you know, handling um, the situation, but also helping them, you know, select the right programs of learning for their people. And and I have to say, you know, as some of my network of so we've just turned off all learning and development. And my response to that is why, you know, at this time we're doing more, more than ever in terms of allowing our people to do, you know, additional learning and development. So I think, you know, at, at this moment in time, um, you know, we, we've got a lot of support for our leaders and managers. Um, 
great thing is, and to your point earlier, Chris, we're seeing leaders or leadership, uh, uh, to be correct, appearing in all levels of our business. You know, when a hierarchical organization at all, but we're seeing some, you know, some of our young new talent coming through as, you know, really strong leaders of, you know, let's have a happy hour, let's do a coffee morning, let's do storytelling. We, we are across our business divisions, you know, selecting 20 people to come and tell their stories. You know, simple things like this is creating this network. We also, and, and this applies to myself and, and other executives in the business, we're doing a lot of one-to-one um, you know, discussions, coaching with our leadership group. Um, you know, it's something we do on a regular basis, but leveraging our senior team to help us through this has been, you know, really, really valuable for us. And, you know, we, we wouldn't be in such a positive and strong position without our leadership group. No, and I think it's clearly, you know, everybody likes talking about these sorts of things, the people factors, the leadership, the culture factors, but yeah. I think we are going to have to to move on to some of the other areas. Um, yeah. but just to close off, I think there's a nice point made by, by Jules Amos that, you know, this, this leadership element that you've spoken about, you know, it, it is quite ambiguous. It's not just about leaders and maybe no. actually in the future, this is about understanding a different matrix within the organization and about yeah. different ways in which we operate. And maybe it's starting to drive different organizational design and different ways of working. And so that, that, I think that's a really nice way to kind of close that bit off and start to, to move things you touched on it there, Mel, you know, to this, to this element around how you're operating at the moment and the mm -hmm. practicalities of what you're doing, but also the real nitty gritty of what you're thinking about in terms of that transition, you know, to, to a new day one, to the restart, as, as you call it. So, so what exactly are you doing and how are you planning for that transition at the moment? Within, within your so, so, so right now, it's a great point on organisational design. I'll pick that up in a moment where you talk about you know, moving, moving on and into the future and, and looking at how we you know, bring people back uh, to the organisations in one shape or form. But mm -hmm. the operational perspective, um, you know, we, we've got a a really um, you know kind of multifunctional uh, command group in place which is led by Exco we have a daily command call we have a weekly board update um, our uh, operations teams have got BCP uh, planning they, they have a daily call same across people HR communications customer group uh, and obviously finance around cash flow management so we've got a um, governance structure set up um, across all areas of the business uh, to manage the here and now and, and in addition to that we are absolutely keeping a focus on scenario planning for the future you know not not about over predicting what might happen because mm -hmm. do any of us know right now but we are doing a lot of detailed work around scenarios um, in terms of operationally and i'll just focus on that which will give a flavor um, uh, around the changes we've made uh, over the past weeks and obviously as I said earlier we're global so we started many many weeks ago in APAC but yeah. we successfully moved three and a half thousand people to work from home. Um, I have to say the, uh, the uh, way we invested in technology you know you don't have to be large or small organization you know just just having the right tools um, you know has been really helpful um, as I said earlier, we've got a massive effort around communications being transparent, authentic. You know, we, we openly report if we've got cases suspected or confirmed, we tell everyone in our organisation where they are and, and what status. You know, we have a weekly CEO. Uh, we're doing some fun things around happy hours. We kicked off a one kitchen challenge, which we've got everybody cooking around the world and sharing the recipes. So some really nice kind of engaging, uh, connecting comms. Um, from working from home, um, we've uh, shared, as I said earlier, webinars around best practice so operationally, you know, helping people to adjust, you know, reworking the diaries around homeschooling, looking after elderly parents. You know, we, we've got best practice uh, modules we've shared. We've done webinars, conversations with leaders. Um, mm -hmm. One of the key things I feel around the working from home or the operational part is, is making sure people have an end to the day. So, you know, stepping out for some fresh air, you know, signing off a message to team saying I'm offline now. You know, I think that's been a, a closing off piece is something we didn't spot early. We've done that now. It's, it's important that people have an ability to switch off. 
Operationally, we've paused on recruitment, uh, and that's absolutely critical, um, with the uh, intent of investing in protecting the current workforce, um, which is, is something we feel passionately about. Um, looking, as I said earlier, around priorities, but we've also uh, set up hit teams uh, across the business to look at you know um what what can we do better what can we do differently um and we are actually as i said earlier we haven't stopped investment in learning or development we're continuing to drive our marketing activity yeah. you know as, as you know we've clearly looked at cost management as it would be prudent to do so but we're, we're not trimming everything back we're, we're trying to be really balanced around what can we continue, albeit at a lower level, but not turning things off, just turning things down. Yeah. Um, around uh, the transition, uh, as, as people are calling it, transition or return to work, I think is a, is a better way of thinking about it. Look, I, I feel it will be a gradual process. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you hear a lot of people talking about when, how, you know, it will not be a, a kind of, you know, overall return to work and everyone goes back to the office. I think that's, you know, naive to think that. Um, in fact, there was a, a Fortune CEO initiative. I don't, I don't know when it, anyone follows this, but really interesting around the variation of thinking. One CEO said we'll be back, you know, September. One was early next year. One was, well, I'm not sure it'll ever get back to normal. So you've got varying degrees. I think with us, what we've been planning on is, you know, various phased approaches to, um, you know, how we can bring people back. For instance, we have over a thousand people in India, in Delhi, you know, how can we think about, you know, phasing um, people back to the office, you know, what we can do around understanding, you know, how we best perform, um, you know, operations. Um, but, you know, a dependent factor, I think, for all of us to consider is, one of the major limitations around you know, re return to work is around childcare. Um, you know, lots of parents struggling with this now in every jurisdiction, every home across the globe, you know, and all looking after relatives or, or extended families. So I think that's a key dependency which we must all be aware of. Um, so in, in terms of things we're actually doing, uh, we're serving our people. Um, there are many of our population who feel, you know, working from home could be a longer term um, uh, opportunity. Yes. Um, we're looking at, you know, gathering data on that um, to, to really give us the opportunity to plan, you know, what would it look like where, and it will be different uh, by areas. So we're gathering info, uh, we're looking at modeling around, um, you know, shift working, uh, not using communal areas, uh, even looking at the use of PPE in, uh, in office environments, health and safety, you know, is paramount, you know, protection and safety of people, you know, both from a health perspective, but mental well-being is, is priority. Uh, so we're constantly looking at, you know, what we could do and seeking a lot of advice around this, uh, evacuation plans, uh, risk of premises, you know, people visiting premises. Um, so we've got a piece of work in place around all the protocols and policies, um, including, you know, social distancing, you know, how do we separate desks? You know, how do we deep clean? So all the pieces, um, yes. you know, yeah. which will, you know, allow us to get back to work. But, you know, I think who knows, but we're working on the basis of, we will have a, re you know, return to work at some stage, but we'll do that, you know, with the priority of health and well being of our people in place and, and I think what, what's going to be, and back to leadership, here we go again, um, what will be critical in any return is that leaders will need to encourage compliance. It will be very easy for people just to drift back uh, into the way things were. So we'll be relying heavily on leaders and managers to, to make sure that people uh, comply to that. No, that's, that's a really, that's a really yeah. valid Lots point. Lots of planning. Yeah. <laughs> lots of detailed planning and you know it, it is interesting picking up on that particularly on that risk element that you, you spoke about there you know I, mean, I can remember in my in my previous job before i mm -hmm. you know been, been in doing quirk solutions you know my last role was having to pull together the extraction plan for all of the uk combat forces from afghanistan when i was working in whitehall and to the government and you know a real challenge there around the fact that we had a population of individuals who we were shifting so you know we were we were drawing them down and moving them out other people were taking them the other way in this scenario that we're talking about here but same sort of principle 
but we were also taking out equipment at the same time but that equipment was there and designed to protect individuals so we had a decreasing population of individuals on a glide path with a decreasing kit and equipment profile on a glide path but with a gradually and exponentially increasing level of personal risk mm -hmm. so i think that you know this detailed planning of the you know the resumption coming back to to work and this transition back to work We'll have to be thought through quite carefully because as we're already seeing from some of the scientific advisors and sage and others they are fully anticipating spikes back in infection rates as gradually the release is is and the, and the gates are opened up if you like on the tap um and i think that's you know that so you've got that element of it and so i suppose testing comes in here you know obviously you know people have heard me banging on and on about testing so i won't make a big deal of it today but there's so many different ways in which you can test those plans. And I particularly like the fact, you know, you're doing, you're doing the scenario planning that you mentioned, because for me, scenario planning is not necessarily about creating a plan, as, as you rightly pointed out. It's, for me, it's about creating agility within the organization, because the more you're thinking about the options, what you could do, the potential solutions, what people might do, then the more agile you're making yourself in the in the future when the inevitable problem happens by being able to shift quite quickly because everybody's got that that clearer understanding um i think i'd also like to pick up on that that element that you, you spoke about about your sort of the investment and and, and the marketing and the messaging and, and the communication going out from the organization investment you know simon delve and others have been making the point that it's absolutely the wrong time to stop investing in our people right now because they then feel even more pressure and feel abandoned when they are staying at home. But equally, we want them to be as effective as they possibly as they possibly can when they resume work, you know, and come back into our normal workplace. Um, and so you've got that, you've got that sort of, if you like, investment in those individuals. But I was listening to a fantastic conference the other day, an online conference called We Won't Stop Talking. And the last speaker was um, Professor Mark Ritson. Now, he had a very firm and robust view that actually there may be an initial shift to a different way of operating and different cultures and behaviors that very quickly will settle back to where we were before. But the thing that I did find really interesting about what he was saying was he then went on to talk about share of voice and that there's this curve which is constant and the evidence will show that it's constant on a graph between marketing effort in terms of time and people hours, maybe sources some cost and market share. And therefore, what tends to happen when we go into a drawdown period is that people reduce back on that marketing because it's a cost. But that means then they drop off the curve. And therefore, when the system stabilizes, it has to go back to balance and therefore it goes to a lower market share. And he explained that of the 300 unicorns that came out of the last downturn, 90% of them invested heavily in communication, engagement, collaboration, you know, getting much wider, as you were talking about earlier on, with, you know, with customers, not just internally. So I think there's some really interesting bits and pieces there. Um, another question, which I won't put you on the spot for, you can have a think about now from uh, Lorraine, what organization or leader do you consider as a role model in the current environment? Um, I'll, I'm, I'll happily answer, answer that one first from, from my perspective, um, which for me uh, is, Lorraine is, is Brother UK and Phil Jones that was on last, last time with me on, on the second webinar that we did, where they are taking initiatives like um, for events that they had already pre-planned, they are paying the suppliers and the event management teams that were going to be delivering that to keep them on track. They're also deliberately doing um, activity around marketing, engagement, communication, so that they're, um, the teams that support them in, those, in that sort of PR world essentially are, getting, are getting, getting support and help, as well as working really hard on caring for their individuals in the same way as, as Mel has been describing. Um, so Mel, I don't know who, who stands out for, for you. Let's get myself off mute. It's a great question. And look, it's very difficult to pick out. And I'm going to go for a big one, actually, because I do admire what they're doing. And one point on this, I think the, there's a, a really fine line right now around any communication or any marketing. It has to be authentic. 
yeah. it has to be from a position of intent to support you know I, i've seen many uh you know competitors and, and people in lots of different industries you know doing things which you know i take a bit of a breath and think are you really doing that right now so i think that authenticity and appropriateness I have to call out Microsoft and hey, it may, may be a, it's, you know, the big gorilla in market, but the work they're doing around giving back the support they're offering to their smaller organizations, you know, the, the kind of the work they're doing around investing and, and opening up, you know, a lot of their patent work, for instance, um, you know, around technology to help facilitate the AI center that they are just in my view, you know, best in class around doing this with grace and authenticity i think yeah. Yeah, they've come on a huge journey around their organization but i think super impressed around they're just and their communications are at grassroots it's their you know leaders and managers across the organization oh, satire is doing you know some big comms but right now that they're, they're reaching into their localities which i think is admirable and i think we should all look at them as you know driving what I would say is is the right approach in terms of communications and actually giving back. But look, there are many of our customers and including ourselves, you know, giving back. Um, we ourselves internally sort of a, a hardship fund for our people. Yes. Um, you know, we're doing things with our customers. Um, you know, I'm seeing, you know, the insurance companies, you know, giving back, you know, there's so much of this going on. And I think, yeah. again, I think that's, that's a testament to a restart where I think commercially organizations around their, their, I think brand, the trust around brands and authenticity around giving back will become even more prominent as we come through this, this pandemic. No, absolutely. And, you know, and this is our own small way, isn't it, of trying to help people as well from, from our perspective of trying to help 126 people think and reflect in maybe some different ways. You know, so there's lots of ways in which people can do this. This doesn't have to be about marketing to try and sell something. It's about engagement. It's about that authenticity and about that willingness to, to meet that purpose. You know, like you yeah. say, if, if what drives me is trying to help people all the time, then it feels right for me to set up a series of webinars to try and help as many people as I can who, who are listening in. But if, if, we start to, if we start to shift now more towards that situational <laughs> awareness piece, there's a couple of good points being raised by people. Um, Rowan Jackson's raised the point that at the moment, in a recent US study, 37% of um, all jobs in the USA have now been shown that they could be done from home. And of that, that represents 46% of all USA salaries. So that actually is potentially a huge shift. If that shift in does, does move, particularly for the strategic then ramifications of, well, if all of those individuals then are no longer in an office, what happens to property prices? What happens to all of the supporting infrastructure that goes into offices and the companies that rely on maintaining, you know, it, it, all the air conditioning and things like that? And the, the ramifications and the second and third other consequences that come on. Uh, and Richard Overy's also raised the point that, you know, about situational awareness being important because he's based in Dubai and he's talking to us at the moment from <laughs> Dubai, um, where they've all been thinking about well, what happens next and yes, thinking about some transition and all of a sudden the government have announced some re relaxation in the restrictions and it's caught everybody off guard. <laughs> so what are, what are you doing about, you know, about sort of trying to keep your eye on that, on that sort of ball, if you like, and yeah, what's, yeah. What is, what's your, view, your view of what the future might hold? So I think they're, they're really interesting points around you know, the, the, in, in my view, there will be a shift. Um, you know, as he said earlier, if people aren't going to offices, those buildings don't need clean service, etc. I do think there'll be a fill. I think that the whole working um, world will shift and I think there'll be a fill of, of new opportunities. Um, I think in terms of the future, like I mentioned it earlier, and I do feel very strongly about this. I think businesses, um, we're going to compete on trust and responsibility. And I think relationships that are built on shared, which is, is super important and values is going to be right at the forefront of any successful organization in whatever category uh, moving forward. Digital transformation. So look, this is a super hot, probably overused uh, term topic, um, but I do think it will drive and fast track overdue changes in many categories across the globe. 
I think it will also drive, uh, you know, a it, it not just drive force a new way of working. I think more flexibility, more agility, better use of tech and tools. Um, I think it will change roles. I think to the point around, you know, that that a proportion of people will it will become the new normal working from home. I, I do think that is the case for for many roles and, and many organisations, um, and that offices you know, will still be needed for certain, um, certain activities and, and connections, etc. But there will be a, you know, re, re architecture of how organisations work. But I think that will also create some new roles in, in different areas and roles probably we don't even know exist right now. Um, I think engagement with customers will change. It'll be more tech based, you know, yeah. uh, consulting reviews that are done on site will be done virtually. In fact, we've just done a, a virtual, um, diagnostic for a customer actually based in the Middle East, uh, which is, right. is working really well, but it'll be more faster, more real time. So I think, you know, those, those shifts in customer behaviors will, will force us all to think around more seriously around digital and automation. And um, so I think, you know, in terms of what will stick uh, when we move into the next phase, as I like to call it, um, remote working will continue. It'll be more video, there'll be less travel. Um, I think about us as an organization, we've traveled a lot. Do we need to? There's lots of people saying, well, actually, why did I need to go and do that workshop? I do it, you know, very successfully in, in video format. Um, yeah. I think, it, you know, when, when offices do reopen, and look, they will. I don't think you could, uh, you could sit here and say, we'll eradicate offices, you know, across the globe. But they will still exist. I think they'll be redesigned, different use of space, uh, different um, you know layouts um, I think well-being will be absolutely up there yeah. uh, I think you know leaders being you know or having the permission to be vulnerable you know it's it's okay I think mental health um, you know awareness will come absolutely to the forefront because we're right in it now so there'll be a greater appreciation um, I think organizations will think lean and more flat uh, in terms of their organizational designs. I think we mentioned this yes. earlier. Yeah. Marketing will be different. I think, you know, more authentic, um, more kind of purpose based. Um, and I think, you know, this, the, the whole kind of silver lining, I think we're all seeing. And, and again, this is something I, I'm, you know, very passionate about. We're seeing, you know, authenticity around waste, excessive spend, you know, the, the whole kind of, green agenda yes. well, absolutely you know we're all we're all kind of wishing or hoping for a, a, a change here a circuit breaker as i would call it i think we've got that yeah um, and i think look look some categories retail for instance i think will be completely reinvented and i think that there's a great opportunity for a seismic shift which already was happening but i think will will take place um you know even faster than we thought so i think moving into the next phase um i do think there'll be a demand for faster innovation, uh, yeah. you know, how we, yeah. we improve and make things better. I think will be, you know, much, much more in demand. I think there'll be a greater need for talent and, you know, from a talent perspective, there are clearly people, you know, being made redundant coming out of roles, but that creates a fantastic talent pool um, of great people looking for the next opportunity. So I think, again, that's a positive for us all to think about. Um, but, you know, the, the biggest thing, in terms of the future will be, I, I think, a very different approach to collaboration and problem solving. I think that will throw up a, a new way of thinking around organisational design and that matrix you mentioned earlier, Chris, I think yeah. see big changes in the way organisations design and, and, you know, set up teams in squads. And, you know, the, the kind of, I mean, there's a lot of learnings from the software world here, which I think we'll, we'll take into other areas of, of the business and other categories. No, totally. Uh, and, you know, and I, I love a lot of the elements you've brought out there, which essentially is about building your understanding of what is going on in that situational awareness. So you make sure you're on the right map. I think that there's a, there's a risk sometimes with this type of environment where organisations understand where they want to go. They know their compass heading and they've got their compass in their hand, but they have made assumptions about what the map looks mm -hmm. like. And when those assumptions are then flawed, they suddenly find themselves, you know, well, we, we're not going where we wanted to go because we're on the wrong map. We've got, the, we've got the compass heading, but we're on the wrong map. So it's about drawing out that understanding. And, you know, to pick up Alison Kerr's point earlier on, 
about how do you help as managers for employees to be engaged. I think this is an ideal opportunity in a way um, for us to use people who maybe are furloughed or working from mm -hmm. home um, yeah. to, to enable us with that understanding, you know, make them the reconnaissance forces that are out there hunting for the information, you know, and I think that as leaders, it's, as leaders, it's our job to be making decisions, but it's not our job to be doing all the analysis and looking for the information. So, you know, paraphrasing a comment I've made on a previous webinar, if we ask the right questions of our teams, and if we then give those teams a task to go and look for the information and see what's out there and then come back to us, then they're engaged, but they're also getting a much wider understanding of the strategic landscape around us. Um, and, you know, they're developing their talent and developing their understanding, uh, you know, in the process. So I think that that's, you know, that's, that's really quite, quite key for me. Um, there's a couple of questions just to pick up on um, that we'll do before we quickly go into the last sort of 10 minutes around innovation and creativity. Um, but from Graham Goltz made a point here around, again, from working from home. And I know we're sort of cycling back to the people piece at the start, but it's, it's an important point, I think, Mel, that... Um, you know, he had a switch off mechanism, which was his route to work and back, you know, and his commute to work and back became part of his switch off when maybe you listen to some podcasts or you do a bit of reading or whatever else it is. Whereas because now his place of work is 20 feet from his kitchen, that, that you know, you've, it feels like you're at work permanently. And so we, you spoke a lot there about probable shift to working from home and increased working from home mm -hmm. you know what what sort of things can we do to try and transition gradually in that in that home environment do you think so it's a great point and and i mentioned this earlier i think um we're, we're hearing these stories across you know the globe um and, and from a personal perspective there, there is a danger of your um, days and weeks lending into one. And actually, I, I've worked a lot with leadership, particularly around having a weekend. I, I have noticed a lot of people blurring into a Saturday and Sunday evenings becoming, you yeah. know, let's get things done. But, you know, I think to that point, it, it's a great um, challenge for us all to think about how do we create that personal space? And I think, you know, listening to a podcast on the train, you know, in your commute or music while you're driving in your car, if that's taken away, what we're saying to our people is, um, you know, get up, get dressed, you know, consider yourself, you know, don't kind of lounge around. Think of that as you're getting up and ready for work, which is yes. a massive thing. We've had a few people who've, you know, kind of resisted that and thought, you know, but it's, it's affected, it's a big impact. So, and actually what we're, 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 you know, suggesting to people is put half an hour in your diary. So, you yeah. know, get shower, have your breakfast, but then put half an hour and, and, you know, I've had funny ideas around, well, I've got half hour commutes in my diary morning and night. And I'm being serious here. There's an entry called commute. Someone showed me on a Teams call, That's you know, brilliant. just they read a book or they sit in the garden or on their terrace or, you know, watch a podcast, uh, sorry, watch a, a, you know, YouTube video or something. So I think it's about being kind to yourself and having that discipline and, and I think I mentioned it earlier, overcompensation. You know, I've seen this cause a lot of stress around I'm working from six till 10 because I need to do more because I'm working remotely and do people think I'm working? Yeah. I think we have a huge responsibility as leaders to trust our people and trust yeah. individuals to do a great job and, and, and if they need support, you know, to offer it to them and, and reach out and check. But I think we've got to lead by example. So personally, I have a lunch break with my son I do some schooling in the morning you know whatever whatever and, and, mm. and not accepting a meeting at that time because that's my time personally or that's my time with my son so if we all that, you know it gives people the permission you know to create some space so block out the time in your calendar and do something for yourself be kind to yourself I think I think that that be kind to yourself piece is really important isn't it and we can't lead other people unless we lead ourselves first and several people commenting on the chat about that that they are they have set out a routine and that routine yeah. really helps um i think it's interesting as well you talking about you know the, the fact that we are maybe more engaged and we are more authentic as well you know alistair dornan again coming back about 
you know, customer behavior is interesting and engagement is interesting because we're doing it from home and maybe we're dressed down a little bit and maybe we're a bit more yeah. comfortable in ourselves because we're operating from home. We generate a much better rapport with people and a better relationship with people. And I, 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 I'm, certainly, I'm certainly finding that, you know, I'm having much more, not honest conversations with the people, but much more engaged conversations with people and much more human one point I'm desperate to make on this is yeah, I've yeah. I've seen it's like a window into the person. Yes. A person is in their own space. They're in, you know, it, it, it's taken away and, and, and again being just completely open, almost the facade of office. Yeah. We're, we're in our own environment. We're in our own skin. We are who we are. I just, I think it's broken down a lot of the kind of superficialness if that's a, a word yeah. around you know I'm at work and I have to be this person and this this for me is driving a lot of creativity and innovation I think that release of you are who you are it, it, it's created a real positive change yeah. in the way people think and the way they operate absolutely um yeah I mean I I was having I was having another webinar this morning where we took a we took a brief pause for for a coffee uh, and somebody's children came through and sat down and started you know, in front of the camera and we were kind of playing and chatting away. And it was, it was, it was just genuinely, you see everybody else on the meeting instantly light up because, because of what we're, we're all real people. Yeah. Unbelievable. So with about five minutes to just under five minutes to go now, just turning to that innovation and creativity piece then, you know, is the, is this whole piece around, you know, clean sheet thinking. So if we've got, little teams and you, the hit teams you were talking about, the scenario planning you were talking about, looking at ways in which we might change and also doing the, mm -hmm. doing the reconnaissance. What about that, how could we reset for the future? Just, just briefly, what are you doing about that? Yeah, so I mean, a lot of this I've covered, Chris, already, but you know, yeah. how we've got this kind of ideas tank with hit teams, we've got people looking at our, our offerings for customers. So, you know, in this, this you know, kind of changed world, you know, how can we deliver better value for our customers? So we're challenging ourselves really hard on how do we come out of this really strongly to deliver further value in our propositions to customers? Um, we're looking internally at our organization, you know, how can we shift and shape? How can we look at, you know, bringing through this new talent, continuing the impact they've, they've had? And I think looking at investment, we're, we're looking hard at what we invest in now, you know, in light of the future and the changes we're, we're foreseeing, you know, yes. what can we do differently? One of the big things we are doing is, um, I think the whole uh, change program, you know, we've, we've all, I think, in our experience, you know, done change, you know, both well and not so well, but I think it will become much, much less formal and more dynamic. I think there's yeah. a real desire for, um, you know, organizations and customers to, to focus on regular change, not big bang. So I think the whole approach to how we change our, our way of being, uh, our delivery to customers, our offerings to customers, I think it will become much more dynamic. Again, back to my, you know, comment earlier around being the agility and being more dynamic, I think will drive us to, to, to move faster, um, you know, to change for the better. Um, so a lot of planning, a lot of thinking, but we are absolutely keeping one mind. How do we come out of this in a really authentic but strong way to deliver value for our people and our customers? No, absolutely. I like the way in which you're, you're engaging as well and, and bringing those, those, those people into the process as well. I, I had a conversation the other day and we were talking about this need for diverse thinking yeah. and diversity of thought within what we're doing because we tend to recruit similar people if we're not careful and then those people get promoted along similar metrics. So we end up with a, a leadership team that are all very much, they're essentially five very brilliant people, but they're all one person because they all think the same way. And I had this question come back to me from a CEO the other day of how can I get my leadership team to think more creatively and be more innovative? And I'm like, well, you don't. You just invite other people in. And it's this right, trust right. piece that you were talking about before and the collaboration you were talking about before. We've all got customers or clients that we could draw in and we trust enough to say, what do you think about this? I'd like to share this with you. And what are your thoughts? Or people in our networks, people that we know, you know, to, to bring them into some of that stuff. And, and get people thinking much more diversely. And I think, you know, so we end up going through this, but I think whether we, just to kind of draw it to a close, whether we do end up in some sort of different future 
or whether the pendulum swings back again. I think to pick up on a point you made at the start now, because it's a nice way to finish, I think is, is incredibly apposite, is that now is almost the point at which people seem to have an increased appetite for a shift. And so now is the time when, for all those frustrating little bits that we've had in our organizations, big and small, would appear to be the time to take the opportunity to say, why don't we do this change and how can we go about designing it? Um, you know, people commenting that, you know, it's, it's about, it feels like this world restart moment mm -hmm. at the moment. And I'm, I called it in a previous webinar, it's about almost like a global transformation and change program that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's actually, you know, if we sit there and wait to see which way the pendulum might swing and what might happen, we're going to miss a huge opportunity. And for me, I think that why not take a risk? Why not take a chance in terms of consulting, collaborating, but also pivoting what we do and shifting what we do to match more of the values and the cultures that you've been talking about yeah. and embedding those in our organization. So Mel, I'd just like to say thank you. Thank you for, for your time. And um, we are pretty much bang on for four o'clock um, and at the end of the hour, which obviously for me as a military person is an important <laughs> thing to get right. <laughs> Uh, and to make sure we hit it absolutely but thank you very much for all of your insights you know the people that are coming through um about uh, you know the comments that are coming through and the you know the, the questions that have been coming through clearly back that up um, and we've just had a lovely message in to kind of finish off with but i won't name them because it would be embarrassing for them but that was delightfully informative and thank you to you both wonderful thank you thank you so much for listening i've really enjoyed talking and you know, I think what we can all do now is share our experiences and share our learnings. That's what it's all about. So thank you, Chris. And thank you, everyone. Thanks, Mel. Thanks to everybody for listening in. Do keep in touch. We will follow up with um, a link to the recording to this particular message. But if you want to get in touch about any other questions about the things we've been discussing, then please do so. Um, and take care. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.